And the Oscar goes to <laughs> Brendan Fazer. The whale. Brendan Fraser is back. After spending more than a decade trapped in the Hollywood basement, Fraser's performance in The Whale has not only put him back on the map, but launched him directly to the top of the pile, netting him the Oscar for Best Actor this year. And since it seems that Fraser is back and is going to be moving on to have still more successes, I think it's okay to admit that The Whale is not a good movie. Now, I don't care what the initial ratings are, this thing is not going to age well once the astroturfed media hype cycle has let go of it. It is poorly written, cliched, badly acted, and worst of all, morally idiotic. Be honest. Tell me what you really think. The premise is undeniably strong, which I think is why this movie comes off really well in lots of reviews. Frazier plays Charlie, a gay, morbidly obese college professor who teaches exclusively online via a program that's not Zoom, but come on, this is obviously Zoom. Charlie is a man who's made mistakes in his life. After falling in love with one of his students, he abandoned his wife and daughter, and then when his partner died, Charlie fell into a cycle of self-destructive gluttony, which is now approaching its final destination. Now, his one desire is to make up for his past wrongs and save his wayward daughter by reminding her of how amazing she is. I think the term Oscar bait might have some application here. Good job! Unfortunately, while that premise is indeed strong, the execution is a train wreck. As is usually the case, the problems with writing can be broken down into three categories bad or even nonsensical dialogue, incoherent plot elements, and finally, thematic elements that don't land. The dialogue is the most obvious and constant offender. Charlie has basically one friend, Liz, who is a nurse and who acts as his unpaid caretaker throughout the movie. She continually tries to persuade Charlie to go to the hospital, but he refuses, claiming that he doesn't have insurance and he'll only rack up tens of thousands of dollars in hospital bills that he'll never be able to repay. Eventually, we discover that Charlie actually has about 120 grand put away. So that was a f***ing lie. But never mind that for the moment. Like I said before, this movie is set in 2016, which means that Obamacare has been available for two years. He also can't be refused insurance based on pre-existing conditions, and coverage must be provided for essential services. It's also a pretty tough sell for me to believe that a job that allows him to bank $120,000 over less than a decade while paying child support doesn't provide health insurance. There's no part of this that isn't, frankly, silly. But at this point, we're not supposed to know about Charlie's savings. Liz gets understandably angry at Charlie for his stubbornness, telling him that he's going to die, and the dialogue is just... <laughs> Whew. When dialogue is done well, it produces the same response as having an engaging conversation ourselves. It has chemistry. It's charming the same way that a person can be charming. This lady gets real spooked and turns around. You got shot? No, some... No. some <laughs> you heard the story. Yeah. Uh, some other guy's car had hit a tree. Okay, it was an accident. <laughs> Anyway, how can you hear the other Shut guy? The Even if it's not terribly realistic, we accept it because it's the kind of conversation that we would like to have. When dialogue is done adequately, it should ring true to the conversations that truly make up the majority of our interactions with people. Not especially electrifying, but practical. When dialogue is done badly, it is neither realistic nor charming, and we get a lot of that in this movie. You're my friend. I know. I'm sorry. You say you're sorry one more time, I will shove a knife right into you, I swear to God! What? This is a bad line, and it is badly delivered. It is in desperate need of a rewrite, and has the same uncanny quality that taints most of the dialogue in this film. I'm gonna shove a knife right in you? Liz, do you mean stab? Because that's what we humans generally say when we are discussing stabby type scenarios. I'm going to stab you. But this weirdness is nothing compared to what comes next. What's it gonna do? My internal organs are two feet in at least. And Liz, for some unknowable reason, actually laughs. And then she starts to tickle him. <laughs> Holy Jesus. The weird stabby line from Liz is obviously just meant to set up this excruciatingly unfunny joke, and her reaction to it is ludicrous. She's talking about losing her friend, one of the last remaining connections to her dead brother, because he is so obese that his heart can't deal with it. And then he makes a painfully awkward joke about how fat he is, and this somehow just makes her forget the whole thing that he's dying? This joke? Good writing relies on being able to convince the audience that they're witnessing plausible human interactions. If you're going to write a scene in which a joke diffuses a very serious argument, that joke is going to actually need to be funny. There is no part of me that believes I am watching two people in this moment. I am intensely aware that I am seeing puppets who have no motivations and exist only to fulfill the needs of the plot. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. 
The entire film is shot through with the same kind of incoherence. It's not just that the dialogue is uncanny or melodramatic, or at times outright cringe. It is though, it is all of those things. It's that it often just doesn't even make sense. Take, for example, the scene in which Missionary Kid is trying to go through his religious pamphlets with Charlie. Charlie interrupts him to ask, Time to deny the gospel, we don't Do have- Do you really think that the world's gonna end soon? That doesn't bother you? No. The kid proceeds to answer the question, and then Charlie interrupts him again to say, I know all this. Then why did you ask the question? He isn't bombarding you with doctrine that you've already heard. Then this line would have made sense, but you asked him about his personal opinions, and he's telling you, and then you say you already know this. This is such a bizarre lapse that I figured it had to be the result of a scene cut, but no, this is how it is in the script. Or how about this one? Charlie's daughter is played by Sadie Sink of Stranger Things fame, who I'm simply going to refer to as Max because the characters are essentially identical. Max is on the verge of failing high school. Charlie opts to help her pass English by rewriting some of her essays. In exchange, Max will come by and talk to Charlie, who says he just wants to get to know her. He also promises that he's going to leave her all of the money. In one of their conversations, Charlie asks if she and her mom are still living at the same old house. Ellie is surprised to find out that Charlie doesn't even know where they live, and inquires whether or not he still stays in touch with her mother. To which he responds, I check in with her as often as she lets me. She really only tells me things about you. Why? Because that's all I want to know about. Charlie says this with his cheesy smile that's clearly meant to be interpreted as sweet, but let's track this conversation. This starts with Charlie asking a question about Max's mom. Max is so surprised by his ignorance that she assumes that he must not even talk with her. Charlie assures Max that he does and then claims that she only tells him things about Max, and the obvious implication is that the mother is being tight-lipped and refusing to talk to him about anything personal to herself. This would be understandable because Charlie has wounded her horribly. Then Charlie reveals that the reason he doesn't know anything about his ex-wife is because he only wants to know about Max. That's all he asks about. I know that this is played as sweet, but Charlie just admitted that he doesn't care about the mother of his child while simultaneously implying that she's the one being controlling or withholding. Because that's all I want to know about. Or take Missionary Kid's final scene where he's explaining that Charlie's daughter contacted his church. Listen closely. Your daughter. She took these pictures of me smoking pot and, and recording or something like that. And she found my church in Waterloo somehow and then she sent it to them and they sent it to my parents. And, Wait. and, and you know what they said? It's just money. Charlie then summarizes what he's been told like this. She found your church. She tracked down your parents. Wait, what? That's literally not what he said. She found my church in Waterloo somehow and then she sent it to them and they sent it to my parents and them and they sent it to my parents. She tracked down your parents. Dude, why are you nodding? Since I don't want this to be a four-hour breakdown of the dialogue, I'll stop there, but there's so much more. The dialogue simply does not work. At the movie's start, when Charlie's heart is going berserk during a self-care session, he asks Missionary Kid to read him an essay, which eventually becomes an important part of the plot. We later find out that this essay was written by Charlie's daughter. It's a book report on Moby Dick. In the book, Captain Ahab has lost his leg to an encounter with a white whale, and this wound has poisoned his mind so that his life can have no joy until he's avenged himself on the animal. In case it isn't obvious, Charlie is Max's whale, and he wounded his daughter deeply by leaving her such that her life has been totally altered, and she is now not the person that she was perhaps meant to be. This setup is the best thing about the movie, and it's truly disappointing that it isn't done any justice. This is supposed to be Charlie's redemption arc, but the problem is that Charlie, despite oozing this soft-spoken superficial niceness, and despite Fraser doing his best to make the character sympathetic, is an asshole. He only contacts Max after learning that he's almost certainly in the last few days of his life because he wants to get to know her, and then after she displays a little of her passionate hatred for him, he decides that he wants to save her by reminding her how amazing she is. This is cringe. What does Max actually need? She needs resolution to the hurt that was done to her by Charlie. Now Charlie's had years to begin the process of trying to heal the wounds that he gave her, but he hasn't. He only contacts her here at the end, treating her as one last loose end that he needs to wrap up. I need to know that I've done at least one thing right, he cries emotionally, once again indicating his primary concern is for himself. There are also problems with the logistics of his plan. At first, Charlie won't get treatment because he supposedly doesn't have the money, but when it's revealed that he has more than enough for treatment, he won't get it because that money is for Max. This is idiotic. It has been, at most, 10 years since Charlie left Max and her mom, so at the bare minimum, he was saving 12 grand a year to arrive at the current sum. 
Now this is almost certainly not the case, as he probably wasn't living this way prior to Alan's death, and probably wasn't saving as aggressively. This is also not counting the child support that he no longer has to pay now that Max is about to turn 18. So even if Charlie's treatment cost something obscene, say $60,000, $80,000, he would be able to pay that off at the current rate within a few years. And if his intent is to provide for Max, then, and I, I really can't believe I have to say this, if he lives longer, he can work more, and that means more money for Max. But what's more, he'd also be able to, you know, spend time with her, get to actually know her. The fact that he would choose to die giving her this one last pat on the back, you got this girl motivational boost, rather than spend as much time as possible with her, shows how contrived the entire scenario really is. Do me a favor, please. Get out of here. Yeah, Plot holes come in all shapes and sizes, and this one is a crater right through the heart of the film, obliterating whatever gravity it was trying to have. When you look at it in this light, Charlie's plan isn't just nonsensical, it's a cheap, self-appeasing band-aid for all the harm he's done to his daughter, and the fact that no one in the film actually calls him on this extremely important point makes me think that the writer either genuinely does not understand this, or is doing his best to hide the ball. Liz's relationship with Charlie is supposed to be seen as touching, but it's actually pretty f***ed up. She gets really huffy about really stupid stuff, like the fact that he's gone through another roll of toilet paper. Liz, what did you expect to happen? How do you think this works? And you might say she's just frustrated because she can't stand seeing someone she loves do this to themselves. Except then, you find out that she's actively helping Charlie kill himself. She's literally bringing him entire buckets of fried chicken and massive meatball subs. Oh sure, she'll talk about the medical interventions he ought to be considering, even though he apparently has a history of turning down these options, but saying, no Charlie, I'm not going to bring you a family-sized bucket of KFC, I'm not going to sit here and watch you eat yourself to death, that's just a bridge too far. This perverse codependent relationship between Charlie and Liz is never resolved or even examined. It's played as if there was no problem here. Even in her final scene, she brings him a couple of meatball subs. I got you two meatball subs, extra cheese. With extra cheese. And tells him, I don't think I believe that anyone can save anyone. Really, Liz? Well, here's some good news. You could start by just not doing what you're doing right now. Max is a sociopath, there's just no way around it. She is awful. This may be the biggest distinction between her roles here and in Stranger Things. Max also has a caustic personality in the show, but only a little bit of prodding is required to reveal some good in her. That's not the case here. Max isn't just a hard case. She is a sadistic, bullying prick. The sleeping pill scene is easily the most egregious example. Max has knocked Charlie out by crushing up an Ambien and putting it in a sandwich. Missionary Kid shows up wanting to do his missionary thing, and Max drags him inside, assumes that he's too sheltered to know about pot. Like, who is, who is this made for? And then mocks him for saying that he used to have a problem with it. I was smoking every day, I had a problem. You were a stoner. You had a hobby. <laughs> Here's what I'll say about this situation. If you are ever feeling uncomfortable about your use of any mind-altering substance, and someone dismisses those concerns or mocks you for having them, f that person. Cut them out of your life, you will not regret it. Missionary Kid gets up to leave, and Max tells him that if he leaves, she will kill Charlie by feeding him the rest of the Ambien. She then tells him that if he doesn't take a hit off her pipe, she'll call the cops and say that he tried to rape her. <laughs> Women. At this point, Missionary Kid's reaction should be to get up, find a phone, call the cops. I know that Max goes on to say that she's just messing with him. I don't care at all. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. But instead, instead, he takes the hit, reminding me of why I hate literally every character in this movie. There's more to the scene, but it doesn't even bear mentioning. Max's character is already beyond redemption. She is so casually cruel and psychologically abusive for nothing more than her own amusement that I simply can't be bothered to care what happens to her. Does Max expose Missionary Kid in order to help him? So obviously the script is written so that we're meant to think that this was likely her intent. And since Max is not an actual person who can have hidden motivations that we're not aware of, the question has no real answer. But I will say that this interpretation has some pretty big flaws. Number one, everything that we know about Max up to this point indicates that she has very little faith in people, especially religious people. Number two, contrary to her belief that everyone is an asshole, this plan can only work if Missionary Kid's parents aren't that. Number three, there's little things like the fact that she chooses to orchestrate and then send photos of him smoking pot, which would be certain to give the impression that he was using church money to buy drugs, which isn't great optics and also isn't the case. Number four, there's basically nothing else that we can point to to provide any evidence that she cares about anyone at this point in the plot. Like, yeah, she'll have her breakdown for her dad at the end, but as far as we know, that's the first time she's cared about anyone for the duration of the film. 
Anyway, the point is that if this is meant to rehabilitate Max's character, it is done very, very poorly. Another recurring subject throughout the movie is Charlie's obsession with essay composition. Like, I get it, it's his career, but this is still too much. He's continually bothered by the fact that his students don't invest any of their personality into their work, and he constantly stresses both to them and to the audience the importance of being authentic and revealing yourself. Of course, this is contradicted by his unwillingness to show himself to the class. After being seen by Dan the Pizza Man, Charlie goes into crisis mode, and he sends a message to all of his students that says basically, fuck the readings, fuck the essays, just write me something honest. Because that's all that matters, right? Honesty. Being true to yourself. This is supposed to be Charlie's big breakthrough. And he has this breakthrough in a scene that is perhaps the most unintentionally pathetic thing I've ever seen. Charlie is back on Zoom and speaking with his class. Apparently, his students have complained enough that he's going to be replaced, not that it really matters at this point. But he stops and says that some of the students had responded to his request for something honest. And he begins to read them to the class. And they are incredible. Christy, you wrote, my parents want me to be a radiologist, but I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Julian, you wrote, I'm sick of people telling me that I have promise. <laughs> I think I need to accept that my life isn't going to be very exciting. <laughs> it feels like you're watching the millionth iteration of an idea that was once substantial and impressive, but is now so hackneyed that it would be mind-numbing if it weren't so hilarious. He tells them that because they've been so honest with him, he's going to be honest with them, and he turns on the camera, showing his appearance, and even panning the webcam down to look at his bloated legs in case they hadn't quite gotten the full picture. He then pulls the camera right into his face and tells them, These assignments don't matter. This course doesn't matter. College doesn't matter. These amazing, honest things that you wrote. My parents want me to be a radiologist. I don't even know what that is. They matter. <laughs> and he chucks the laptop. <laughs> Mike, what can you even say about this? This is the most failed mic drop moment I've ever seen. And beneath that, it's even worse. Over and over again, the film tries to make this case that honesty is what really counts. You can say anything, no matter how cruel or boring or insipid, so long as it's honest. But Max hasn't been turned into this hardened shell of her former self because Charlie wasn't authentic enough. It was because he was selfish. Yes, leaving your wife and abandoning your daughter, walking away from the commitments you made to people, that is selfish. And I'm not going to knock the value of authenticity, but the substance of morality is about honoring the duties we have to other people. And while the film bangs on endlessly about the former, it's an open question whether or not its creators have any conception of the latter. In the conversation between Charlie and his ex-wife, she confesses that she thinks Max is evil. Charlie? She's evil. To which I actually laughed out loud. There's something about how corny so much of the dialogue is, contrasted with how matter-of-factly and sincerely Samantha Morton delivers this line, and just how true it is. To drive the point home, she shows Charlie a Facebook post from Max featuring a picture of Charlie with a caption, There'll be a grease fire in hell when he starts to burn. To which Charlie inexplicably responds, She's a strong writer. The wife's reaction is my second favorite line in the movie. That's your response? God damn it, Charlie, what is wrong with you? That's not evil, Charlie says, that's honesty. Do you know how much bullshit I've read in my life? The wife runs off saying, I don't understand you, Charlie, because really, what else you could say? I mean, I guess you could say that that's insane. I guess you could point out that honesty and evil are not mutually exclusive, unless Charlie thinks that the problem with Mein Kampf was that the author wasn't a strong enough writer. This theme reaches a climax of absurdity in the final scene when Charlie is screaming at his daughter, This essay! Stop. It's impossible to tell whether or not the writer wants you to think that Charlie has lost his mind, or if this impression is unintentional. Is this tragedy, or is it farce? What do you want me to feel, film? This is why authorial intent matters, because if this is a movie about a man trying to redeem his life at the end and going insane instead, it's pretty successful. The dialogue's still trash, though. I know. I'm sorry. But if it is meant to be seen as a triumph, then this is an absolute dumpster fire. Ultimately, the whale reeks of fakeness, of having been contrived by someone who has never experienced these feelings and has no interest in trying to really imagine them, and is merely trying to craft an emotional reaction based on repetition and imitation of other works, similar to the way that an AI might write a poem. And I think that this is why it has to place so much emphasis on the grotesque spectacle of Charlie himself, which has been rightly criticized as misery porn. 
When all the hype has dried up, I think that The Whale will be looked back on as a film with profound aspirations held back by its creator's inability to understand, let alone comment on, the deep human emotions that are ostensibly its subject matter. But whether this happens or doesn't, I sincerely hope Fraser is able to do some good with his second chance he's been given, and wish him all the best.